this. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. I've developed ever so far. Fantastic. Woo -hoo. Yeah, fun. Yeah. Right on, right on. Uh, my name is Patrick McDavid. I'm here to sort of take you on a lightning tour of Amazon Web Services and uh, serverless computing. Is anyone here using serverless computing in your lifestyle yet? Just a couple of folks. This is going to be all new to most of you, so uh, I hope you have a good time with this. <laughs> um, again, I'm Patrick McDavid. I'm the CTO of BombBomb. BombBomb Bomb builds video tools to help people make connections on the internet uh, more easily with new friends. Uh, we're hiring a couple of my uh, guys in the back there want more friends at the we work out on Platts, so uh, you can hit me up if you're looking to do uh, services back end, that sort of thing. Uh, we're definitely hiring away. Um, so the plan today, we want to talk about uh, sort of how, where service came from, what it is, and the history, sort of the context it exists in. Uh, I, I've been doing web apps since uh, since like '99, so uh, I've seen a lot of this new, you know, the cloud sort of emerge. So we're going to talk about some of that history, uh, and then I've put together a little sample app to show how we can use JavaScript to tie together a bunch of uh, Amazon services or just different little pieces to make something cool pretty easily. So I'm going to show you around that application. Um, so, uh, who's using Amazon Web Services today? Bunch of folks. Um, are you using, are you, uh, the last talk we saw a lot of screens about how to click through Amazon and set up things manually. Who's doing that kind of a thing? Configuring buckets by hand of the day. Who's using something more like Terraform or CloudFormation? Those are tools that let you sort of write configuration files that will put servers up on the internet for you. That's awesome because you can put them in version control, right? Um, Amazon uh, launched in 2006, so it's been around for a little while, and it, is, it started kind of small, right? Amazon, the business, was running all these uh, this web app in the cloud selling socks and the like. Um, and they were realizing that they needed to start offering these same kind of things across all their web properties. They launched these three initial services. Uh, S3, the simple storage service, which is just files in the cloud, essentially. SQS, which is just a messaging service that lets one application send a message to another and not lose that message in transit, which becomes a big deal when your apps need to talk to each other and not miss, you know, sock orders. Uh, and then EC2, which is just computers available on demand uh, within moments, right? You can hit a button and get a computer for whatever you need to do, uh, built by the hour. Um, and there is a user interface in front of these things, and when you get started with Amazon, you'll probably start with that user interface, but these are primarily really offered as APIs and SDKs, toolkits that you can uh, build software around or uh, have be sort of an engine inside of your software. Um, and it was a huge deal. Um, when I was doing computers in you know the 99 sort of era, you were sending purchase orders off to you know, uh, rack space and things like that to get service delivered like two months later with like annual or multi-annual contracts. And so you'd be like committing to a $20,000 spend on something that, you know, you can't get for months. And so it was just slow and awkward and ridiculous. This is the kind of thing where you add pennies and suddenly you're running a computer. So it was a huge change in the landscape of computing, right? Um, and I'm just a fan. I didn't know I was for this. Um, and so cloud computing was this huge revolution, right? And all these things kind of grew on the back of that. Uh, it, you know, Microsoft, Google, each had their offering that space. Um, and those three services still are some, some of the first things you will learn when you start doing cloud architectures. Uh, but there's now over 90 different services that Amazon Web Services alone offers. Email, uh, CDN tools, uh, machine learning tools we're gonna go through today. Any, every, any and everything you want to do with computing, you're doing it uh, available to you for pennies, essentially. And on the back of this, right, this is essentially like computing in, in on the internet, way, way cheaper. And so SaaS businesses just exploded, right? All, all of a sudden, all this stuff you were paying uh, developers more to do over slower time scales, you could go faster and do it cheaper. So the SaaS world just exploded. You all are here because of that, essentially, right? These boot camps are just a business around this new model where we can do faster and cheaper. Um, and uh, this platform as a service thing started to happen where uh, you just bring code and they'll run the code for you. This stuff that just made all this stuff so much faster. Um, you know, JSON or REST, this stuff is the lingua franca that people went to boot camps and all of you were speaking of today. Uh, and so it was good. I was all, all grew on this sort of thing. Um, so it's fast, but I don't know if who could make sense of this. Does anyone recognize anything like this? So, um, this is your sort of standard issue Amazon 
a highly available web application diagram. I'm going to walk through it quickly. Uh, essentially, there are these two major sections on each side, right? These are availability zones. These are virtual sort of separate data centers that host on the front side computers doing the computation. Um, then talking about maybe web applications and databases, but the, the thing to take away from this is that essentially to do cloud computing well and resiliently, so that when one of these um, ephemeral computers maybe goes offline because some server at Amazon got sick, right, you need to have this load balanced, uh, well architected cloud infrastructure. That is a mouthful because it's hard to do. That's a discipline that takes people a long time to get good at, right? Uh, there's all these components that you will spend a month or two just getting conversant in. And so it's fast and it's excellent, but it's also complicated, right? So uh, it's excellent, but there's a lot to learn. And the other thing here is uh, Jeff Bezos is the richest man in the world now, right? <laughs> richest person. And uh, I'm not saying it's because of this, but the secret to all this is that all those little rectangles on the last screen, they're billing you by the hour for all of that. And this is a, a actual screenshot of one of Bomb Bomb's fleets. And essentially, this is CPU utilization, right? And, and on Amazon EC2, you're paying per hour of CPU availability. And so we're using something like that 20% on the bottom, but we're, you know we're paying for the whole 100%. So we're essentially just blowing money out the door hosting this stuff. And to get to a place where you can really effectively utilize that 100% and like really run those CPUs at a high rate, you need to be doing a certain amount of volumes that you can be doing predictive scaling kinds of things. And that's even harder again. So all this is to say that to do cloud well and without breaking the bank, you're going to need to have a bunch of skills at, bay, at play here, right? Um, in 2016, Amazon, there's one person, one group that did this before Amazon, but Amazon really popularized the idea of functions as a service. So we had uh, where the new paradigm is that you're going to give Amazon using their um, Lambda tool some code, and that code is just going to sit there and wait for a request to come into it. And so the difference there is you're not paying for a server to be always running and idling and waiting for some, something to happen. You're going to wait for an event to happen of one kind or another. These events could be uh, an HTTP request coming to your browser, or it could be any old thing. A file appears in your file server storage, or uh, a stream message happens when your uh, Internet of Things device sends a ping up to the server, right? Now you're not paying Jeff for all that red time, all the time that you're not actually using the service. This was sort of a new revolution, and the, the, the idea here is that you're not paying per hour, you're paying for hundreds, hundreds, uh, hundreds of milliseconds at a time, essentially. So you, now Lambda bills you at something like a ten thousandth of a penny per gigabyte of memory per millisecond. So it, it gets way, way, way cheaper if you have a sort of occasional demand, which when you're starting up new projects is really where you are. You're getting thousands of requests an hour or maybe millions, but not the kind of thing you need to have sustaining fleets of servers to be effective. So um, this is a huge new deal. It's really a new idea where you know, they've already got the standing fleet. They'll let you sort of dip into it as you need it on demand. Um, and uh, that's about it. <coughs> So, um, how do you leverage this? Uh, to start off with, they give you a place where you can upload a zip file full of node code, right? And that's fine and it's easy. But to sort of orchestrate something that's going to be uh, easy to use and easy to develop on, uh, this gentleman put together a project that he called initially Jobs, JavaScript on AWS essentially. And uh, it, is, it sort of drives Lambda, it puts your code into Lambda, but it also has a, uh, uh, an, a command line tool where you can have it deploy all your infrastructure for you. So not just put the code on there, but it'll also drive things like turning on databases for you, putting cloud buckets out in, out in the world, and all of that. So it gives you sort of a all wrapped up sort of place to do serverless application deployment from the command line. Um, this, the, you're, you're gonna get a link to these slides, and I would encourage you to check out the story of serverless. The, the gentleman puts together has this really endearing tale of sort of how he got excited about this, and, um, he's got he's sort of a movie fan, which sort of inspired the name. But the, the YouTube is pretty interesting to hear sort of his take on this whole story. Um, you will not find the Jaws framework anymore because they literally got sued by Steven Spielberg and the gang. Um, so they changed the name, and now they call it the serverless framework. Now it's worth making a good distinction here that 
serverless computing is one thing. That's what I just described, essentially, right? These functions on demand as you need them. But the serverless framework is a particular toolkit uh, developed first for JavaScript, but then later over to other languages that can deploy serverless code into lots of different places. So the rest of the talk is more or less going to focus on serverless as it's used to deploy applications to Amazon. Uh, so, um, how many of you watch Silicon Valley? Yeah. Silicon Valley has a great gag where um, they want they have they're, they're you know doing incubators in Silicon Valley and they they want to make an app that would detect foods and give you sort of like power cuts or whatever, right? So they had their the the kid make the app as hard as they could and they ran a test. They wanted to shoot a hot dog and it was like, would detect this hot dog? And they're like, yes, it works. You only train the thing to detect hot dogs and not other foods. It's a huge disappointment, all this, right? So uh, to demonstrate the serverless stuff here, I want to build a similar kind of hot dog app. So you guys want to check this out? Pull out your phones, if you would, and join me at hotdog.cloud. Doesn't work as well on a laptop, sort of a phone-centric experience. So who's got their phone app ready to go? Come, let's come. What? <laughs> Wi-Fi box. Turn Wi-Fi off. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this serverless app to go and detect whether there's a hot dog around. You guys ready for this? Point your phones at this. So what this is going to do is it's going to pop this image up to the cloud. It's going to hand it off to an Amazon. Um, Image recognition service, and it's going to test to see what it sees here. It's going to see things like walls. What'd you find? It's not a hot dog. It's a projection screen. That's right. He did it. Any pizza hits? I'm going to walk up closer. Actually, no pizza. No pizza at all? I got a ornament. A diamond. A diamond? A gemstone and jewelry. What am I paying Amazon for? <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll try another guy's right. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, 
And then the other file, the serverless.yaml file, uh, has just a few things that are going to matter to us today. You're going to, you're going to give it a name. You're going to uh, tell it where you want to deploy this stuff. So again, if you go to uh, Azure or whatever, but we're going to use Amazon. The kind of runtime you want to use, this stuff is Polyglot. You can use serverless with Python, C Sharp, and a bunch of other languages. We're going to stick with JavaScript. And then you give it a list of these functions that you want to run. And so um, it's sort of a map of all the things that you're going to want to do. We're going to see that this one essentially has three calls that we use to do this hot dog trick. Uh, and then, I don't know, you guys want to try this thing live? Live demo? Yeah. I'm nervous, it's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, you can run serverless at the command line, and SLS is the short version of that. So this should just create a new folder with a developed ever empty node project in it, right? So from scratch, live in front of you now. Um, 
So again, not the right way to do that, but we did it with this. It was the easiest way to wrap it up into one, you know, half here. Um, there has been in the last few months a new plugin that came out for Surplus that actually does that for you. It's called Surplus S3 Sync, which does all the right things that we were just hearing about in the last talk about uh, wrapping it up into the CDN and bundling and shipping it. So you can actually have it ship a folder from your chronic doc into an S3 bucket and tell the CDN about it, which is slick. Um, and another thing to know is that you can run Express code on here. So if you're a node developer, you're going to know a lot about Express. And uh, there's no reason you can't run an Express app on top of Lambda. Um, my favorite part about the serverless framework essentially is that it not only will put this, the apps, uh, you know, the app into land before you run it, but it will also deploy and manage all the other assets you need to run your app. So this could be a MySQL server, or it could be, uh, you know, a bucket to put these uploaded images in, essentially, right? Um, and so. If you've ever done the CloudFront or the um, Terraform work, it's essentially you just use the same syntax in line here. And so it can be version controlled along with all the rest of your code. It just keeps it all in one place, which is awesome. So um, here, we really just had to put that S3 bucket out there to hold all the uploaded images. And we just put all the rules, all the bucket properties that you saw in the last talk you were here, him going through the UI setting up, you can just set it all up here. Run it, test it, see if it works. If it doesn't work, run it again. And then we get it right, put it in version control, and you have that forever. Um, so we're essentially just creating a bucket, allowing these posts to it, get, lets you download the images, put, lets you uh, request to put the images up, post actually takes the images, and then head can check if there's, uh, the images have been changing. But again, we can put all sorts of things here, like databases, etc. Um, another thing that you're going to need to know about is essentially all these resources need to be allowed to talk to one another. By default, they're not going to have access to inter, you know, communicate with each other. And so another part of your uh, of your service file is these I am role statements. Now, I am is Amazon's sort of identity and access management system that lets you uh, say that when my Lambda function runs, I want it to have these rights against other, these you know credentials to run uh, commands against other other Amazon tools. So we essentially have to allow Lambda to both get to do this um, recognition thing, which is doing the image analysis, and to do this uh, S3 uh, sign upload URL signing. So with these two things, we allow our Lambda to be able to talk to these things, and then that stuff is run uh, through the SLS deploy command. Um, so these Lambda serverless apps have no user data on them. You never want to put user data on them. The container that these apps run in uh, the, are very ephemeral. Uh, those disks will almost always be wired between runs. That's not actually always true. We had a bug at work once where we were storing video parts in a Lambda, and it turns out they weren't actually wired on. We started stitching together the wrong parts. We didn't expect that. It was really weird. Uh, but you cannot depend on that server uh, to hold on to files at all. So um, we needed to get, we need to essentially bypass that for the upload by getting the sign around. Side. So on the Lambda side, we just we take the request to get the upload. We go and just run this S3 command that goes and gets a object, sign your object to URL, just hand that on back. Then on the browser side, we can just do a regular post up to that Amazon endpoint, and the file just come up. So it's very you're all using sort of very native tools on both the browser and server side. This is all just glue code essentially that I had to put together to get this all working. Um, so that image analysis was also, again, I hardly had to do anything. I just had to tell this Amazon recognition computer vision API to go look at the image that was just uploaded into the bucket. So again, here's just more blue code where I just tell that in my bucket, this you know, image name that the client just uploaded just would tell me what it sees in there. Uh, recognition is cool, and it's been getting a lot of updates. Uh, you can have it do all sorts of different kinds of detection. It can detect labels, which is what we were using, you know, various nouns of any old kind, right? Or you can have it detect faces, so you can train it. You can say, this is John or Jane. Give it a few examples of John or Jane, and then it can look at new images to see if it recognizes John or Jane again, right? Um, it can uh, do moderation labels, so it can watch for stuff that you might not want to be posting on your site, and uh, give you sort of danger warning values, essentially. Um, and it actually has a recognized celebrities API, where you can give it a JPEG of whoever, and it'll tell you that's George Clooney. 
Why not? <laughs> they essentially, I think they essentially just wrap the detect faces or the uh, compare faces thing with the celebrity database for you. So kind of fun to play with you, play with it on the, on the user interface. Um, so uh, when in the demo that failed terribly, uh, you would have seen that we uh, would have got this terrible endpoint where it's just like blah 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 dot lambda dot amazon dot com. And we want to do better than that, we want to host it in hotdoc.cloud. So Amazon gives you this Route 53 DNS service that's all wrapped up and easy. Uh, Route 53 is awesome because it has lots of deep tools about routing based on where you are and uh, what servers are performing. So you can do things like uh, route to servers that are healthy or route to servers that are near you. Um, you should, uh, don't need that to start with, you can just use a simple DNS service, but it's wrapped into Amazon and you can use right there. Um, this is a, a video of a of a ge geography-based routing tool where when the servers go down in California, all the traffic gets routed up to Chicago or something like that. Um, Amazon also gives you the certificate manager service, which, allows, which gives you free SSL certificates uh, very easily configured on Amazon that are auto-rotated. Um, do you guys ever have to rotate SSL certificates? It's like you have to relearn it every six months or a year, and I forget it. It's terrible. So like that, that is gone now. And, and, uh, with things like the SSL Everywhere, what's the new project that it's awesome you don't do that anymore. Anyway, Amazon wraps that all up for you and gives you SSL certificates. Uh, easy to use. And um, the gotcha at the bottom of that is that you need to verify that you own the domain that you're trying to route to, right? So uh, they want they need to send an email to me at hotdog.cloud. Well, I haven't sent an email at hotdog.cloud right yet. So uh, it turns out they also offer these simple email service. And one of the things that the simple email service can do is it can listen for mail coming into whatever you tell it to listen to and give you essentially a JSON dump of what was in the email. So um, you can do anything with that, like trigger a Lambda or whatever, uh, but just uh, that's a, yeah, it's essentially in trying to set this up, I have to go pay Google for a hot dog dot cloud email. Most times I was able to get a JSON dump of a verification email they were sending me. So just know that the simple email service is available. It's awesome if you want to have an email based workflow, they sort of have a durable store for incoming emails that you can treat as objects, and uh, it's a neat little workflow thing to do with Lambda. Um, we talked about API Gateway earlier. It's essentially a front end for the kind of, for uh, any old thing. It's neat. You can use it to uh, hand request into Amazon Lambda, or you can have it sit in front of a REST API that you already have, uh, and then you can sort of reroute where those same endpoints go. So you can essentially have a facade in front of anything you want to host. You can have certain sub paths route to one thing, other sub paths route to another. So if you want to start offering version APIs or anything like that, you can sort of have it in one place and then have it uh, change things around behind the scenes without having to change the infrastructure on the front side. Um, but again, serverless just wraps it up super easily for you here. Um, there's a few different sort of patterns you can employ uh, with your serverless applications. Um, it's sort of how, where, where do you want the complexity to be in your JavaScript. And so um, there's essentially the three leftmost patterns are the ones that you would probably run into the most. I think microservices and services are probably the best ones. And so on the left, you see that you're sort of breaking up everything into its own function, where the user's grade handler just does that. It has its own endpoint and all this. Um, whereas in the services column, you're really getting more of a REST style design, where you have the different verbs doing the work of uh, you're sort of catching the verbs inside of your request, so you're going to look at that um, context of the request to sort of switch where your code is going. Um, then you get into the model which was sort of like all your, you're going to do your own routing inside of one big function request, which you might want to do for some reason, but it's going to be heavy and more responsibility for you. And then the graph service is essentially you want to offer a query interface. You want to have a single endpoint you're going to hand sort of queries into, and then you'll give data back based on the query that's there. This is all up to you and your app sort of application design. Uh, there's a blog post about why you might make those choices there. And um, so serverless isn't good at everything. Uh, it's really good at sort of doing simple request response sort of patterns uh, on demand, but it's not good at things like sockets. Since those servers are going away, there's no way to hold the connection open and like listen to an event easily or message back out on a socket easily. Um, but there are some hacks. There's, Amazon has this IoT thing that is sort of built to listen to you know, millions of devices out in the world. You can sort of hack that to uh, send events out that way and hear your sockets against the IoT product. Um, 
Servos is also sort of very resource bound. Uh, when it was originally launched, I think your, your function could only run for a minute or two. Um, and then they upped it to five minutes, and recently they upped it to 15 minutes. Um, it's essentially a trap. So it's very cheap to run this code when it runs for like a half a second or less, essentially. But when you start running code on Lambda that runs for a long time, the cost actually goes way up from what you would pay for a small regular compute instance on Amazon. So when you're designing things for serverless, you want to make sure that they run and get the heck out. Because if you run long, it'll start to, it'll start to cost you way, way more. Um, since these are, it's, all, it's, it's essentially the same problem you have with microservices when they're all, when you have these smaller services and they're all inter-messaging, it's harder to keep it in your head essentially where the different services are and how they're intercommunicating. So um, it's the same challenge that you have with microservices where uh, you're going to have to keep that all in, in your head and sort of really reason about where the service boundaries are, if that makes sense. And uh, that's essentially it. Um, it's, it's worth talking about. Amazon offers a very functional free tier where you can do all this stuff without having to pay a bill until like your millionth Lambda call. So you can really play with it until you start using production where you have to give Amazon much money, which is pretty slick. They really like, let it be a playground until you get too far. Um, in the last few months, Amazon's been releasing these serverless databases. So it's essentially, the, the first one they release is essentially a MySQL server that you only pay for when the queries are running. They like manage to keep the indices and the data sort of in cold storage until you actually need them, which is neat. Um, in a couple of project that, the projects I've done with this, the most expensive part of it is running a database that was always online behind it. You're going to spend tens of dollars to do that with a tiny server. Um, anymore, now there's this MySQL that sort of turns out as you need it, which is great. That keeps your bill down in a tiny, you know, for hobby projects. It's great. It's very, very cheap. Um, again, you don't need the serverless framework to play with serverless computing. It just kind of can be an accelerant for you. Um, some other stuff I want to do with my project, but yeah. Um, there's a great sort of Python native one, uh, serverless framework equivalent called Chalice uh, that lets you do all the same sort of things, but it's more Pythonic if that's your interest or flavor. Um, it's pretty slick. It's, had, it's, it's actually built by a team at Amazon themselves, so it gets very, it's very well funded and it's doing pretty well if you like it more on the Python side of things. Um, that's about it, really. Any questions? What's the link to download of the slides? Oh, it's at hotdog.cloud. It's oh. in the top right corner. Oh, okay. Yeah, you want to get the slides? <laughs> uh, is Lambda or serverless making uh, steps to try and implement sockets, you know? Or is that just sort of a boundary? I think essentially that's going to be a boundary, right? The ser serverless computing is essentially just event-based computing. So I, 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 I should know more about what Microsoft is doing, but I would guarantee you that Amazon is going to put some top layer in front of it that will sort of keep the sockets alive for you. And with things like their application load balancer, that doesn't yet, actually I think maybe it does actually talk to Lambda now, those things are absolutely coming. Thank you all very much.